Hello, um, hope you are having a good long weekend. This is the video lecture for chapter 3 and I hope you would have watched this video when you come to class next Monday. So chapter 3 is all about cells and tissue. As we have talked about in the past, cells are the structural units of all living beings and a cell is the smallest thing that you can say is alive and a human body consists of trillions of cells and depending on the structure they all have different functions um, like they can metabolize and digest food they function sometimes in disposing waste um, when they're really really thin they can allow the movement of a lot of gaseous molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide all cells have the ability to grow and reproduce and some of them can move around and <clears throat> all cells respond to a certain type of stimulus so <clears throat> If you want to look at the major elements that make up the cell, you have carbon and hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen, which are, make up uh, most of uh, the cells. Now, depending on whether they are plants or animals, you might have more or less trace elements like iron, phosphorus and sulfur. But in animal cells, the cells are majorly composed of carbon and hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen all cells consist of about 60 to 80 percent water and <clears throat> different cells have different characteristics based on the type of organism now plant cells are they have a different structure but animal cells uh, they have <clears throat> a different structure of their own because of the type of function but since this is human anatomy and physiology, we will be looking at the general structure of animal cells. <clears throat> so this picture shows you the general structure of animal cells. In general, they have three main parts or regions. The first major part is the nucleus. The nucleus of all cells have a DNA, which is the genetic material. And then you have the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is basically um, just the semi-liquid portion inside the cell in which all these little organelles float around. So it's not just a solid structure. Like I said, all cells contain 60 to 80 percent um, water and Cytoplasm is basically the inside of the cell <clears throat> and the cells consist of a boundary known as the plasma membrane. In some cells, right outside the plasma membrane, they might have a cell wall, but not all cells have a cell wall. For example, animal cells do not have a cell wall, but bacteria and plant cells do have a cell wall. Now, if you look at the nucleus, they are the major control center of the cell. They contain the DNA, which is required for building proteins. And DNA is necessary for cell reproduction. Without DNA, the cell won't know what to make. So for every process in the body, DNA is uh, the main source of code so <clears throat> the nucleus itself has three major regions that we will look at in a little more detail so in this slide uh, you see a close-up view of the nuclear envelope i'm going to use the laser pointer okay so this is the purple structure that you see in this picture right here. So if you look at a closer view of the nucleus, there are three major regions of the nucleus. The outermost region is the nuclear 
envelope. The nuclear envelope consists of DNA and proteins. And <clears throat> inside the nuclear envelope, there is the chromatin, um, which is DNA and proteins held together in a very complex form. And this dark blue region is the nucleolus. So nucleolus is important for ribosomal assembly. And ribosomes are the structures in the cell that make protein. So ribosomes for making proteins are made right over here in the nucleolus. So if you look at the nuclear envelope carefully, you see these little channels um, which allow passage of substances in and out of the nucleus. These channels are known as nuclear pores because not everything can just easily pass through the nuclear envelope. So nuclear pores allow the passage of substances. <clears throat> So the membrane or the outermost region of the cell is the plasma membrane. And if you remember from the previous lecture, the plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So they're made of lipids with a phosphate head and they make the barrier for cell contents and they separate cells from the surrounding environment to maintain homeostasis in the cell. So the word homeostasis, I hope you understand the meaning of homeostasis because we will come across this word over and over later. So if you take a closer look at the plasma membrane, you can see the plasma membrane has a very, very complicated structure. So as we studied in the previous chapter, lipids make a plasma membrane so if you want to look at a simpler structure of the cell um, and let's just assume this is a cell plasma membrane basically surround the cell and make a double phospholipid or a bi lipid layer outside the cell and if you look at the cross section of the plasma membrane this is what it would look like. So the plasma membrane primarily consists of phospholipids and proteins. So phospholipids, I'm going to write this down. So plasma membrane primarily consists of phospholipids and proteins. So all these big blobs that you're seeing embedded in the plasma membrane are phospholipid bilayers. So the proteins play an important role in the membrane functions. For example, they can function as enzymes, which are biological catalysts, and they can function as receptors for hormone. Now the glycoproteins and glycolipids, for example, can mark the type of blood cells you have, a uh, blood type you have, like O positive and O negative. Glycoproteins also um, help in recognition of antigens. So they have a lot of different functions. So a sugar molecule attached to the protein is called a glycoprotein, whereas a <clears throat> Yeah, whereas a lipid molecule attached to a sugar is called the glycolipid. So in some plants, you have something called, sorry, in some uh, animal cells, you have something called as a glycocalyx. So glycocalyx are basically just sticky stuff on the cell surface that help in attaching the cells to other surfaces. Okay, so the other thing you need to pay attention to is obviously the structure. The structure, like I said, is made up of mainly phospholipids, which have a lot of proteins embedded in it. The phospholipids have this round phosphate 
head which is the polar head and then they have a tail which is a lipid tail so these are amphipatic molecule because they have a phosphate head and a non-polar tail this phosphate head is a hydrophilic molecule that is water living and the lipid layer that you're seeing these tails are hydrophobic so they are water fearing so this region of the cell is of the plasma membrane is hydrophobic whereas these regions on the cell are hydrophilic so everything on the outside and everything on the inside is mostly uh, dissolved in water so it helps that these phospholipid heads are hydrophilic in nature now <clears throat> if you take a closer look at the plasma membrane you see the yellow structure embedded in the plasma membrane so the yellow structures are cholesterol molecules like i said in the previous lecture cholesterols are important because they help in maintaining the fluidity of the phospholipid bilayer So these are just the functions of proteins in plasma membrane. They help in functioning as enzymes, receptors for hormones. Sometimes they can act as channels or carriers when substances cannot pass through easily. We'll study transport through plasma membrane in a lot more detail uh, later towards the lecture. So if you look at the role of sugars, um, you have glycoproteins that are attached to the proteins on the extracellular surface. Sometimes you have glycocalyx, uh, which are some sticky sugar molecules on the cell surface. Okay. <clears throat> so if you look at the structure of the cell, they have some junctions, uh, which are selectively permeable or impermeable, depending on the substance. There are three types of junctions within the cell. The first one is tight junctions, which are impermeable to substances. Desmosomes, which are anchoring junctions. So these desmosomes basically help in attachment of one cell to the other. So the cytoskeleton or the skeleton of one cell helps in attachment to another cell so they can be held closely together if not all these cells will fall apart so desmosomes help in attachment of cell one cell to another cell and then you have gap junctions gap junctions are communicating junctions for example during nerve impulse molecules can easily pass through the gap junctions in the cell <clears throat> so cytoplasm in general is everything inside the plasma membrane and there are three more components of the cytoplasm first one is the cytosol which is the fluid like substance or the semi-liquid in which everything floats so the nutrients electro electrolytes and everything else is actually floating in the cytosol and then you have inclusion bodies that store nutrients or cell products and then we have something called a cell organelle cell organelles are actually the small units or structures in the cell that actually perform the functions inside the cell so they are the metabolic machinery of the cell okay so if you look at a close-up structure of the cell um, this over here is the plasma membrane so keep in mind the plasma membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer and animal cells do not have a cell wall but plant cell will have an additional cell wall so do the bacteria have an additional cell wall on the outside of the plasma membrane and the innermost region of the plasma membrane is the nucleus so this is the nuclear envelope and these little pores are nuclear pores that are channels for passage of substances 
This region over here is a nucleolus where ribosome assembly takes place and ribosomal DNA is made. So the first major structure inside the cell is the mitochondria. So if you remember uh, in the lecture, we talked about the um, energy currency of the cell, which is what? ATP. So if you remember what ATP is, ATP is produced in the mitochondria. So mitochondria helps in powering the cell. So it's called the powerhouse of the cell. So the mitochondrial wall, if you look closely, consists of a double membrane structure with some infoldings, also called as invagination. So these little foldings are called cristae on the inner membrane uh, structure. So the outer membrane is a smooth structure that you're looking at and the foldings are the inner membrane foldings known as cristae or crisca. Now, the mitochondria carry out reactions in which oxygens act as a final electron acceptor and in the process, food is broken down to produce a TP molecule, which is the energy currency of the cell. So the next major structure in the cell is all these bead-like structures that you're seeing. Let's see. So these bead-like structures are all called ribosomes. So the DNA for ribosomes is enclosed in the nucleolus and ribosomes are made in the nucleus and they are brought out of the nucleus later. So nucleolus contains the DNA for ribosomal assembly. <laughs> okay. So ribosomes are present in absolutely every type of cell. Bacteria have ribosomes, plant cells have ribosomes, animal cells have ribosomes. Ribosomes are actually made up of proteins and something called as ribosomal RNA or ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid is another type of nucleic acid, uh, which is the last type of biomolecules um, which are important in making up a cell. And ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis in the cells. No matter which cell you will be looking at, they will have a lot of ribosomes in it because this is where protein synthesis occurs. Without ribosomes, you will have no protein synthesis. So keep in mind, ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis in the cell. So you can see that the nuclear envelope on the outside, you see a lot of ribosomes. Everywhere inside the cell, you can see ribosomes either attached to a membrane structure or freely floating in the cytosol. A cytosol, keep in mind, everything inside the plasma membrane is a semi-fluid, -li semi um, semi-liquid structure known as the uh, ribosome, uh, sorry, known as the cytosol. And these bead-like structures are called the ribosomes. So ribosomes can be found at two different locations, either in the cytoplasm or the cytosol or they can be attached to another membrane and structure that you see all these foldings inside the cell. These are known as the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum can be of two types. They can be rough, uh, rough because they have a lot of ribosomes attached to the surface. So when you look at it under the microscope, they have a very rough appearance. So rough endoplasmic reticulum are charted with ribosomes and they synthesize proteins. And once they have synthesized proteins, a part of the ribosome pinch off in the form of vesicles. And these vesicles carry proteins to other parts of the cell that we'll talk about, talk about in a minute. So cells that mainly function in making and exporting proteins are rich in rough endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes as well. <clears throat> so
So the second type of endoplasmic reticulum is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum are embedded again in the cytosol. The difference between smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum is that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum do not have ribosomes attached to the surface. So when you look at it under the microscope, they look really, really smooth with nothing on the surface. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum mainly function in storage of ions like calcium. They help in storage of water. Sometimes they help in storing unwanted substances, but they mainly help in storage of lipids. So they are smooth because they help in storage of lipids. They do not help in making proteins. So keep in mind, rough endoplasmic reticulum are rough because they are started with ribosomes. Their main function is to synthesize proteins. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum looks smooth because they are not started with ribosomes and they mainly help in storage of lipids and ions. And once um, they, they are done with their function, both smooth and rough, they can pinch off certain uh, part of their membrane and they form something called as vesicles that carry proteins to other parts in the cell. So any cell that is making proteins constantly will be rich in endoplasmic reticulum. So this video over here, oops, don't, it's not working. So I'm going to just pause this video for a second. Oh, there it is. So I'm going to play this video on how organelles are involved in protein synthesis. Please watch this video carefully.